welcome everybody to the Leaders Podcast. My name is Matt Santos. Today on the show, we have a very special guest. He is the executive director of the John Maxwell team, which offers speaking, selling, coaching, and most importantly, leadership training to professionals in small businesses, all the way up to C-suite level. He's also the president of Robert J. Claxton and Associates, helping passive teams become cohesive, high-performing units. He also holds the business coach seat at BNI North Stars in Edmonton, and he is also a former pastor. Please welcome to the show, Bob Claxton. Hey, Bob. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I, um, <clears throat> I heard about you through a colleague and figured that you would be a great fit to bring this perspective on leadership to the show. So what got you into a career in leadership in the first place and why you're passionate about it? That's a great question, Matt. And uh, I think the, the thing that I did was I ran into leadership without even knowing it. Because when I was about oh, 15 or 16 years old, there was somebody that was an adult that was very influential in my life who said to me one day, Bob, I think you've got leadership qualities. And I went, what? I didn't know I had anything. I was just having fun. I was a teenager. And I was enjoying life. And that kind of set me on a, a collision course to kind of figure out what leadership was, was all about. And so over that period of time, it was basically leadership development by trial and error. And when I uh, was 18 years old, I jumped on a bus and uh, took a 52 hour journey out to uh, Saskatchewan to go to college. And there I uh, was trained, as you said, uh, in the pastoral role. And so that was the basic uh, training of my career and what I was going to be doing. So I was going to be working with people. And so I had to learn how to do that. And, but I really never learned what leadership was. And so I uh, started ministry and about 10 years in, I hit a wall and I couldn't get uh, the people to, to uh, go in a certain direction. And I was frustrated and I could tell they were frustrated. And a friend of mine uh, said, I think, I think you need to go and visit a guy by the name of John Maxwell. He's coming to Toronto He's doing a three-day seminar, and uh, he said, "I think I think it might make an impact on your life." And I went, "Okay." I you know I was desperate. When you're when you're desperate, you'll do just about anything, Matt. So I um, I was living in Mississauga at the time, so I took the GO train downtown every day, and uh, uh, was introduced to who now is my you know my friend and my mentor, John Maxwell, and he ruined my life because he taught me what leadership was all about, and he said, <laughs> "You know, leadership." is influence, nothing more and nothing less. And what that meant to me is anybody can lead because every one of us has influence. I mean, Matt, you have influence over your friends. You have influence over your family. You have influence over your colleague. You have influence over your clientele. Wherever you have influence, you have the ability to lead. Now, before everybody kind of goes crazy on that one, the reality is you either influence them positive or negative. Either you manipulate them for your own uh, for your own gain, or you add value to them and you help them reach their goals and help them, you know, build their businesses and be successful. The other thing he taught me was that everything rises and falls on leadership. So if you think about it, I mean, during this COVID-19 experience, we are actually seeing good leaders and not so good leaders because we're seeing those that are, you know, and we've had people stand in front of us every day, giving us updates, telling us what we're, you know, and some of them were going, you know, uh, he doesn't have a clue or she doesn't have a clue what they're talking about or, Oh, you know what? This person really does have confidence and, and has the ability to, to, to really kind of keep us calm and move forward. And, 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 and so we see that. Um, the other lesson that he taught me was the highest form of leadership is self-leadership. And, and people don't really understand that, but I don't. Can you explain that? <laughs> what, that what that means is the most uh, people often ask me all the time, you know, what's the hardest job about leadership? And I'll say the hardest job about leading is leading myself. Right. If I don't lead myself well, if I don't, if I'm not disciplined, if I'm not growing, if I'm not being other people centered then what happens is then I, then I lose the leadership ability and, and even the moral authority to lead people because I'm, I'm not being a good example. And one of the things we look at with leaders is, is what they're saying and what they're doing matching? Because that, really you know, obviously, like that. right? Obviously, the they're, authority. Yeah. Yeah, because obvi obviously they're bigger on the outside than they are on the inside. 
and when you're bigger on the inside, that's when you're dealing with your character, um, then that's significant. And, and one of the things that I think is helpful to understand is one of the reasons why we see good leaders, even great leaders, all of a sudden they're gone from the picture. It's because of a character issue. It's not because of a competency issue. Think of Enron. Think of some of the places where it was because of the ethics. It was because of their moral fiber that was eroded or they became greedy or whatever it was. It was it's an internal corruption character that actually disqualifies them from leading. Hmm. And, uh, and then he said to us, too, the fourth lesson is the highest value of leadership is adding value to other people. So that's why I lead. It's not about me. It's about how can I add value? That's why I said yes to come on your podcast. It, it, I know there are benefits for me, but my, my real purpose is, is Matt, I value you. And because I value you, I want to add value to you and to your audience. And, and that's really the motive of my heart when it comes to, to leading. So that's how it kind of started. And that was, that was how I met John Maxwell back in 1991. All right. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to date yourself but okay <laughs> i'm an old guy I, I look at my beard i'm i'm dated <laughs> yeah well <laughs> experienced is the term i like to use uh <laughs> but i i really uh now that you actually say it out loud having like being able to lead if you can take that position of your own moral authority i know that it can be very easy to see through people who are, who are just saying stuff and not really following through themselves, not really believing it. And I think you're right. They don't typically last long because no. um, they can't keep up the, the facade. Right. right. We call them posers. Posers. Yeah. Right. Cause all they're doing yeah. is they're, they're, they're saying what they want to say, but they, they, they're not leading. They're following everybody else. I mean, we're, and again, we're seeing that everywhere during COVID-19. We're just, it's just remarkable what it show it has been showing us about leadership. Yeah. It, it really pulls back the curtain on, okay, what's actually happening. And like, it seems to me, this is 100% personal opinion, but it, this crisis period has just kind of, um, exposed how little some leaders actually seem to know yes uh, and they're just they're very likely just giving it their best shot and doing like hey like this is the information that i know and i have to make a call but it's very easy to see that they don't have all the answers either well and and, and matt it's a good point the reality is most leaders don't have all the answers in fact when i was when i was a young leader i had all the answers Right. I could, I could fix you. I sure. can fix anybody. Right. But what I've learned the older that I get is I need to start asking more questions because I don't know everything. And, and one of the things that's about that has exposed people who are, are posers, like we were talking about when it comes to COVID-19 is the people that are actually leading us are getting up and going, you know, as of today with the knowledge and the information that I have, this is the decision that I'm making. Now that may change because tomorrow I might get different information. And, and that to me is a leader with integrity versus saying, this is the direction I'm going, come hell or high water. And I don't care what you think. Now that's, you're not listening and you're not learning. And then how can you lead if you don't listen and you don't learn, you can't lead. Then you're just, you know, you're taking a walk because no one's following you. So you're not leading. You're just going for a walk. Right? Definitely. I think one of my favorite quotes, and this is paraphrasing, um, but I think it's an Epictetus quote, if you're familiar with uh, that kind of Greek area. Uh, it's, how can you learn when you already know? That's right. Yeah. And uh, that's something that I think that's really stuck with me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because then we're closed-minded. And yeah. that's, and, and, and that, there's two people that I really can't help or anybody can't help people that know it all. And people don't think they're worthy to know anything. It's, they need to, there needs to be an openness that I don't know everything. And, and we did this as kids. We were curious all the time. When did we stop being curious and became arrogant? Because we think we know it all. Interesting. 
Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to circle back to this <laughs> because it, it is another question that I love to ask everybody who's on the show, but I'll just pocket that for now. All right. Um, in the meantime, do you want to kind of give us an idea of what you do for the John Maxwell team nowadays? Sure, absolutely. Uh, let me tell you how I got into I, I told you that uh, in 2011, I got an email that said, uh, I'm starting, a, in fact, a, my biggest dream when I met John Maxwell in 1991 was I wanted to work for him, Matt, but he lived in the U.S. and I was in Canada. And I thought, okay. well, that ain't going to ever happen. So what I, was he doing at the time there? He was pastoring, uh, but leading conferences all over the U.S. and Canada. He, oh, and interesting. Actually, I think he just came to Canada. I think Toronto was his first one because um, that was very on early in his career when he started to, to do that. So I, then I followed him. He mentored me from a distance through tapes and through other conferences that he did. Um, and so in, in 2011, I got this email saying, I'm starting the John Maxwell team. Would you want to join? And well, I, of course I'm going to join. Um, so I said, yes. And so I was in the first 450, uh, I was, I was in the first group of 450 people to be trained. And over, over uh, six days, they trained 450 and one. That was probably due to the fact that our hotel couldn't take more than 450 people. But they did back to back. So there was almost a thousand of us trained that back in August of 2011. And I was just on a call this morning with the CEO of the Maxwell Enterprise. And we've just pushed 33,000 people wow. in 161 countries. Wow. And so my role with the John Maxwell team is uh, I'm part of the President's Advisory Council, which is a volunteer uh, group that gives leadership to the John Maxwell team. So there's approximately 250 of us that are giving leadership to 33,000 people. And my role primarily in the PAC is I'm responsible for the member to member resources. So when John writes a book up until just now, um, I've written the document that goes with it that people use as a mastermind guide. That's what our responsibility is. So mm -hmm. when he wrote the book, Developing the Leader Within You 2.0, I wrote the mastermind guide that went with that. And at that time, over 25,000 people were able to use that to train other people in their different countries and organizations. So you're so, a leader, leader. leader. <clears throat> so it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun being at that level because... Uh, and, you know, it, it means that I get the opportunity to be with John a, um, a couple times a year when we're not in COVID crisis. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been a great experience to be a part of. And if I'm working with a group and I run into a problem that I'm not familiar with or a challenge that I can't kind of solve, I just go onto our Facebook page and I can ask, well, for instance, here's an example. Uh, I had a, a fire... Um, a fire captain come and talk to me and say, would you come and, you know, train our fire hall? And I went, okay, let me figure that out. So I went on the face because I don't, I don't, I don't have any firefighters in my family. So I went on the Facebook page and I said, okay, guys, I was, I've been contacted by a fire department. Um, who of you are doing work in it or know more about it that I can set up a call and we can, you can kind of walk me through this. And within minutes, Matt, I had 10 people go, I've done this. I'm a former you know, I'm a former captain, I'm a, you know, whatever it was. And I had the ability to kind of draw from their experience and then be able to go in and, and help this group. And if they can't, if I can't find it within the 33,000 people, I have a faculty of nine people mm -hmm. uh, within the John Maxwell team. And if they can't figure it out because I'm an executive director, I actually have access to John Maxwell. Mm -hmm. And he has said to us, executive directors, uh, have no fear we will, there isn't a problem we can't solve. So there's just a process that I have to go through to get to John. I don't have, you know, I don't have a cell phone number, but yeah. I have access to people who do and, uh, and have his ear. So that's, that's, that's the fun part. And you know what he models at the age of 73, he models continual growth and learning. And that really inspires me to continue to grow and learn too. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, to be honest, uh, before this, I did not know anything about him. Um, definitely, I'm interested in like this entire space, but uh, I'll have to do more homework to follow up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, 
one of the other things that you we spoke about when we initially spoke on the phone was your recent work on grieving in leadership. And I think it's very topical right now uh, as we kind of go through like this whole COVID crisis and things mm, kind of getting back to normal, uh, but not really. And, mm-hmm. and your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's interesting because March the 15th, everything shut down. And you know that, I know that, and the people listening to this podcast know that. On March the 18th, I got a phone call when I was sitting in my thinking chair upstairs at six o'clock in the morning from the hospital where my mother was. And they told me that she had passed away in Ontario. I went, oh, great. I, you know, my brother and sister called me and said, there's no way that we can, you know, have a funeral. Um, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, put everything on hold. She wanted to be cremated, so we cremated her. Uh, whenever we can get you here, we're going to do a celebration of life. But I was just like everybody else. I was trying to survive in my own business and life and, and try to figure out what, what I was going to do with this COVID thing. So I, I knew that I lost my mom, but I had no real physical evidence that she was gone. But then I kind of focused now on what do I have to do to get through this COVID? Because we were learning stuff every day, of course. And we know that COVID changed our lives. But what what was interesting was I, I started to look at how is this affecting me and how is this affecting other people? So lots of people got very, very fearful and a lot of other people became very, very, you know, uh, secluded and, and, and kind of helped uh, protect themselves. Cause you know, we, we, we really didn't know what was going on. No, but, that, that first couple of weeks in, I honestly was afraid for yeah, a lot of different reasons. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and rightly so, because of what we were hearing and because of how things were changing. And, and, and the other part of that, the government was saying, now we're, you know, we're shut down. So you got to work at home. You got to stay home. You can't be with your friends. You can't be with your family. You, you, can't, you can't go to a Starbucks like I love doing and working w- around people because they were closed. Yeah. So you, I looked at it in, in the beginning of March or May. I was again back up in my thinking chair one morning and I was just reflecting and I was going, you know what, I'm grieving. And I'm not just grieving the experience that I've lost my mom. I'm grieving the fact that I, all my rituals are gone. I can't go to the gym. I can't go golfing. I can't, I just can't, you know, I can't go to, to Starbucks like I normally do. All my routines have changed. I'm not getting up in the morning and going and visiting clients and I'm, you know, meeting with them. So that's all changed. All my rituals have changed. All my relationships have changed because now I can't see anybody. And then it dawned on me. That's what grief is because here's what grief is. Grief is always associated with a loss. Now, We initially think about it in terms of, oh, Bob, you lost your mom. So you're grieving your mom's death. Yes. But I'm also grieving the fact that my rituals are gone. My routines are gone. My relationships are gone. Whatever I knew as normal is gone. And, and, and what happened is people don't, what people don't understand is that's complicated grief. So look at it from this perspective. So on, on one level, you, you know, you lose your routines, you lose your rituals, you lose your relationships. And some of us have even lost loved ones. So what happens is it, it, the, the, the grief compounds. Definitely. And so what happens is then we start to act like people who are grieving. And one of the things that I realized when my father passed away in 1990, Matt, I went through um, significant grief counseling and training so that I could help other people doing it. And I haven't done it for a number of years. And as a result of that, I kind of forgot it when I went through this whole thing with my mom until months later. And I realized that even men and women grieve differently. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's not being sexist. It's just, that's just the reality. It's how we're wired. Women will grieve publicly and socially with their friends and they will, and they will cry in tears. They will, they, they will cry forever. I've seen some ladies do on average for sure. Yeah. On average, there's some ladies that don't cry a word, you know, don't cry a lick and that's okay too. Yep. And guys on the other hand, they do it very privately and, and they do it with the expression of anger and not by tears. Mm-hmm. They may cry. They may cry in the, sh- in the shower alone. They may cry on the way to work. They will grieve, but it's very, you know, it's very um, independent. Yeah. 
it typically comes out as anger for men. My, uh, my grandmother passed away last year and it was um, a, also a bit of a turning point in my life too because I had to watch my family, my dad and his brothers go through that and I definitely saw a lot of anger and frustration and it's still, um, it hasn't been the same since. And we never are the same. We mm-hmm. never are the same. And that's, and that's, I mean, we're never going to be the same because of this pandemic. W- you know, we're, we, we just are not. There's not going to ever be, we're going to go back to normal. It is a new normal. For sure. And you're living a new normal without your grandparent. Yeah. I'm living a new normal without my parents. Yeah. I'm living a new normal because I don't have the freedoms. I mean, think of the freedoms that we've lost. And because oh, yeah. we've lost, that's grief. And so I began to think, wow, if that's how I'm experiencing it, then that's how people who are leading teams remotely now, not only are they experiencing it, but also their team members are experiencing it. So for me, one of the things that was very apparent was I I started losing my focus, Matt. Like I'd be sitting there and I would daydream for an hour. And I'm Mm -hmm. going, well, where did this come from? It's not that I didn't have lots of time. It wasn't that I wasn't rested. It was, that's how my body was saying, you know what? You just need to check out here because you're, you've got some, you're on overload. Mm -hmm. So if I'm leading a team and I've got a team member or a two who this can't seem to focus on getting their tasks done rather than getting angry and going, I'm dropping the hammer or I'm going to, or I'm going to fire you. Maybe we need to understand what is it they're actually grieving and helping them to understand that what they are doing is they're actually experiencing loss Mm -hmm. and it's okay. And we're going to get through it, but there's certain things you need to do to go through the process of loss to go from grief, which is the experience to mourning, which is basically processing the grief so that you can actually deal with it. You can, you're aware of it, you appreciate it and you, you start to express it so that you can come out on the other side. Yeah. And and are those the typical steps or are there kind of um, more details, detailed steps associated with that grief or grieving process? Well, there are, there are a number of things. And one to one is to simply recognize that my grief is real and that what has happened as a result of COVID-19 is legitimate. And that's part of accepting that and saying, okay, this is real mm-hmm. and it's, and it's okay. And, he, and here's the problem. The problem, Matt, is in our culture, we don't do grief. No, I'm a private, I'm a, I'm definitely falling into the private grieving person. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even our corporations, they will say, you know what, if somebody dies in your family, you get three days, you get three days to go celebrate. I'll get back to work. What yeah. they don't realize is that your head's not in the space. Even, you may be physically in your office. You may be physically at the, on the line. You may be physically putting your widget and your wadget together, but you're not there. And, and rather than help them, they just kind of, well, just forget about it. So we, we deny it. We defer it. And, and as a result of that, what happens is, is there's an even bigger problem. Because if we fail to be aware of our grieving, then what we do is we start to numb our pain. Now, let me ask you a question. And, and I know the answer to this, so let me ask you the question. Sure. And do you think the profits from the alcohol dispensing units <laughs> have increased or the marijuana dispensing stores have increased? And the answer, of course, is it's rhetorical. Yeah. The, they're the number, you know, there's food that's, that's broken records, then there's booze, and then there's marijuana. Hmm. So three ways that we can actually numb our pain without even being aware of it. Yeah. Oh, I definitely hopped on the, uh, the baking train uh, <laughs> as kind of a coping mechanism, it seems like now. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the joke about COVID-19, right? I've gained 19 pounds because yeah, yeah. I've been eating everything that's in front of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can make a hell of a, be- uh, of a bun now though. So, <laughs> Absolutely. But you see that. And so then what happens is when you don't, 
when you do that, then, then you understand that that's, that's the source of the next problem because then we have addiction issues. Mm -hmm. Then we have engagement issues. Then we have truancy issues. Then we, I mean, we've got product and it's all. And so what happens is rather than denying it, we need to admit it and admit that everybody's grief journey is different. And then we need to take the steps to daily embrace that so that mm -hmm. we can move forward. So we admit it. And then it's just a matter of trying to accept it or own it or. Well, you have to start changing your focus. Right. And so then you have to start looking at well, what can I be grateful for today? Mm. Right. And, and even getting to the place where we you know what, are, what are the, what are the memories that I have of my mom? That I would, you know, I, I, that I'm very happy about that. I'm, you know, you know, I, that's, that's what I smile about. So there, there, there are several different things that we, we can do to help us move towards embracing, working through and going from a place of pain to a place of pleasure in the sense that when I think about my mom now, there are times, I mean, Mother's Day was tough. Um, their anniversary was tough, those kinds of things. And those are trigger days. We have to, and we help, we, you know, we have to teach people about what trigger happened. Grief, grief comes in bursts. Like, what does that mean? It means that all of a sudden something will happen. There will be a song that will be played. There will be something you'll see on television. Somebody will say something and your mind will trigger it to your loved one or to something that you lost. And you'll just, then you'll lose it. Let me give you one story. When my father died, um, Back in, the, I know I'm aging myself. Back in those days, they could smoke in uh, in the malls. And my father was a pipe smoker. When I was growing up, he was a pipe smoker. He didn't smoke later on uh, the pipe, but but I remember when he, when I was small, he I'd make him pipe racks for him so yeah. that he could put his pipe things on. And and I was walking down. This was about eight months after he passed away. I was walking down, doing my own thing in a mall, and somebody walked by me smoking a pipe and I didn't see him. I didn't see him coming. I was, I was preoccupied. I smelt the smoke and it absolutely destroyed me. I dropped to my knees and I started to wail. Yeah. And I went, where did that come from? Well, yeah. it's a group, it's a grief burst and it comes when you don't expect it. That's why one of the things that people who are leading others may know, may experience right now is that why did somebody who's never lost their temper all of a sudden they've just lost it? Yeah. And you know, and over nothing. And you go, what? That's grief. Yeah. That's and I think everybody is very primed for that right now in this kind of high stress, uncertain time. Yeah. As <laughs> cliche as that is now to say, but uh <laughs> but I feel it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think what, what, I, what I really am working on right now is what are the tools that I can give CEOs, managers, HR directors that can help them walk alongside of people? It's not that they come in. You can't take a pill. It's not like, you know, it's not, the, not like the matrix and just take the red pill. You can't take the red pill or the blue pill to fix. This is not about fixing. It's about a process and it takes time. And uh, it's, it's rewarding when you see people actually go through that process. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> that being said, uh, I think a lot of people could benefit from hearing this type of, <laughs> this type of talk right now, because yeah, like the entire world has been through some stuff yeah. right now and we just kind of have to figure out how to get through it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that being said, um, I, I think you may have already touched on it, but is there one thing about this work or about uh, your work in general that makes you the most proud? Would, like, would that be it? Seeing people come out the other side or? Uh, I've always in my whole career seen potential in people that they didn't see potential in. And so I've, I've, I've trained probably 50 staff members over my years of being involved with church. And uh, some of the guys that I trained, they're, they're doing extremely well. They're great leaders. They're leading organizations or churches bigger than I ever had. And that just to me makes me feel incredibly blessed because 
um, maybe I had a little bit to do with helping them understand how they needed to lead themselves so that they could lead others well. And uh, so just at, seeing people pop and when they get the leadership uh, understanding and awareness and they get it and they go, okay, I can grow, I can change and I can make a difference. That to me, um, uh, that happens. And I mean, it happened for me when I was in Costa Rica with the John Maxwell team, there was 250 of us that went down and for three days, we taught 15,000 people on leadership values around round tables. And even in cross culture with a translator, when you saw people getting it, um, it, it's just rewarding. When you add value to people, it just, it just comes back in, in droves. Definitely. Um, so for somebody who's just getting into that leadership position, what advice would you give them? That is an excellent question. <laughs> the first question, or the first piece of advice that I would give them is, why do you want to be a leader? Okay. What's the motive? Is it because you want a corner office? Is it because you want people to give you all the perks um, or have all the perks? You know, the corner office, the special parking spot, um, you know, the big car, all that kind of stuff. Is it all about you? Mm -hmm. Or or is it all about becoming a person that helps other people become successful? Because I think the reality is a lot of people, every, here's, my, here's what I believe. One of my insights is everybody can lead, Matt, but not everybody should. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that is, is because if you don't have the right motive for leading, you shouldn't be leading. Yeah. Yeah, so I that would be my first, that. I, I would, I would say that that would be the first question. So if you were to say to me, you know, Bob, I'm brand new to this and I, I've never done this before. I would ask you, well, why do you want to be a leader? Cause I'll tell mm -hmm. you what, put yourself in the place of some of the leaders of our province, of our nation, of our country, of, of our world. Would you like their job right now? Yeah. The answer is probably not. If you're doing it just for you, you're not enjoying it. But if you're doing it to help people uh, get through this, become successful, stay healthy, because you're doing it for them, it's long days, it's tiring days, there's challenging days, but you're doing it for the right reason. And that, and that, and that makes a huge difference because uh, there is never two days in a leader's life where there isn't a problem that you have to solve. So if you don't want to solve problems, don't be a leader. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I can definitely, um, for people who think that it's easy, because I've seen this too, where it, where I've seen people complain up, so to speak, where they're like, oh, he, his, his job is easy. He just has to sit behind a desk all day. Uh, like, what would you say to somebody who says that, that to you? I, I would say, I would say to them, it's because you haven't walked a mile in their shoes. Uh, you, you know, most CEOs, carry around a leadership burden of I'm caring for X number of families. Mm -hmm. I'm taking care of, you know, employees who have families, who have children, you know, who have spouses, who have children and their livelihood is, is, is really determined by how well I lead this company. And so there's a, there's a leadership burden that people don't really get because they've never They've never really known what it's like to go to bed at night going, how am I going to feed the 90 employees that I've got during COVID-19? Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot on your plate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're not just feeling stressed for yourself. If you're feeling that for all of those people, um, I could, yeah. it's definitely hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> I think I might know your answer on this already, um, but what is the one behavior or trait that you've seen derail uh, leaders' careers? Well, yeah, we did talk about it earlier. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's their character. Um, yeah. It, you know, the reality is, is that sometimes when leaders become successful, they start to believe their own press. And then they, you know, then they start to do the dance rather than do the hard work that's behind the scenes. 
of, of growing and developing and getting perspective and having the right inner circle around them so that they're not, you know, they're, they're being challenged when they need to be challenged and mm -hmm. people aren't just telling them what they want to hear. Um, and that's, and that's, I mean, you, you look at any, any of the celebrities, when do they get themselves in trouble, Matt, is when they bring people around them that tell them they, you know, everything in their life, they're, they're always making the right decisions. Nobody challenges them. And, and then what happens is they start to take a downhill spiral real quick. And that's a, that's a tough act to balance between confidence and ego. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And confidence comes by preparation. Confidence comes by knowing that I'm doing the things that I need to do every day to develop and grow as a leader so that I can, I can face the challenges that are in front of me. It's yeah. when I coast, that's when I'm going to be in trouble. I, I remember looking back over my, my lifespan and I, and I documented the highs and the lows of when I had significant growth experiences and, and challenges that went really well. And those times where I, I kind of really bottomed out and I, and I kind of plateaued. And I, I noticed every one of the times where I was growing, Matt, I had a mentor. I had somebody speaking. I had a coach speaking into my life that said, Bob, you know, you're going down the wrong road here. You're not seeing this from this perspective. Mm -hmm. And when I was teachable and I was, and I was accountable to them, then I had the ability to grow significantly because I wasn't making the wrong decisions. And so I would, you know, I would, I would say that people of character know that they need people around them to keep them on track, uh, especially in the area of their character, because there's, you know, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts even more. And so you yeah. need to be very careful that you have, you know, you put the guardrails up so that you're not going over the ditch. Yeah, for sure. I think you also just touched on a, a skill that I'm personally working on too, is documenting your journey. I don't know if you're a big journaler or, or I don't know if you call it your diary. <laughs> we journal, men journal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I think that's something that I've gotten into, not necessarily every day, but even on a, on a, a even just a monthly basis and just taking yeah. a look back. And I found that's been super helpful uh, yeah. and a confidence booster for myself because day-to-day -day grind i'm i'm like oh i'm not getting anywhere i'm not getting where i want to be at all but then i look back oh like okay three months ago i was at zero now i'm at five <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. absolutely yeah and and one of the one of the practices that i have and i've been doing it for years and i learned this from john maxwell is at the end of every year so between christmas and new year's i actually go back and i review my whole calendar for the year and I, I mean, I, uh, I got, I, I've got my, I have a, well, it's not a, it's a, it's full, full focus planner yep. that I've been, but that I've been using. And so I've got notes in here. So I go through every one of the quarters, and I mark down all the people that I met, people that I had impact with, people I don't need to see again, uh, things that I learned, experiences that I had, and then I can actually see, like you were saying, at the beginning of the year I was at a zero, at the end of the year I'm a five. I've made progress. Yep. And that's significant. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, my, uh, my notebook is digital, but that's just uh, how I do it. That's so, you. That's okay. That's me. Okay. It doesn't uh, matter how. It matters that we do it, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, with, uh, I saw your, the book that you just showed right there, but do you have any uh, books that you can recommend on leadership? That's a great question. And, and the answer is great yes. question. Poor segue. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. If, if you are a brand new person to leadership and you've never really thought about leading, then I would, I would start out with, with, with John's 21 irrefutable laws of leadership. Basically okay. he goes through 21 laws and they stand on their own. They're lessons all by themselves. And the key thing in there, one of the laws is the law of process that says leaders develop daily, not in a day. You just can't go to an, you just can't go to a conference and learn leadership. You have to do leadership. So what are you doing every day to grow and learn? So I listen to podcasts. I read books. I do all those kinds of things because daily I need to be developing and growing. The things that I was learning this morning, 
I was learning because I was reading books and I was checking out podcasts and I was reading blogs. I'm always trying to learn those kinds of things. And then monthly, I, you know, I meet with people. Now it's by Zoom and just interview them and say, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're further down the road than I am. What are you doing that I need to do? And then, of course, like I said before, twice a year, I get to sit next to John Maxwell and I get to hear what he's learning and growing. Mm -hmm. So if you're just starting to learn, and here's the kicker, leaders learn. If you don't like reading, if you don't like growing, if you don't like being outside of your comfort zone, stop mm -hmm. right now, time out. Don't become a leader because you will, you will burn out, you will fizzle out, and you will, you will cause more harm than good. But if you're willing to really become a student of leadership, and that's what happened in 1991 how John wrecked me was I, he said, you have to become a student of leadership. So I have books and books on leadership. So if you are, if you're just starting out, it would be that one. If you are, a, if you are a, a manager or a, a CEO and you're leading a team and you want to know how to lead a team, then I would suggest you read the leader's greatest return. And this is John's book on how to lead other people, how to develop other leaders, not followers, other leaders. This is one of this latest one that just came out. It's an incredible book and it's really designed to help you do that. Now, the third thing that I'd say is if you want to, let's say you're in a leadership position, but you don't have, you know, you don't have a team, but you want to, you want to get to the level where you can actually be a manager then, then John wrote the book, Developing the Leader with the New 2.0. And this is what I use, Matt, to mentor leaders on what it means to be a leader. There's a whole chapter in here on character that we talked about. There's a whole chapter here on personal growth. There's a whole chapter in here on vision. Um, there's a whole chapter in here on priorities. All the mm -hmm. things that you need to know. <clears throat> now, last book, I would say. Oh, it's a bonus. Not, <laughs> it's not in, in as... Just for the it's not a John Maxwell book. I do read other people, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> well, no, it's true. I, I read everything. I read everything um, from um, uh, Simon Sinek. He's, he's just an incredible author, too. And he's yeah. actually partnering with the John Maxwell team, which is kind of fun. This Leaders of Last, yeah. Yeah. Um, or the Infinity, uh, the Infinity. Have you read that one? Not yet. Yeah, that's his latest. It's amazing, too. This is the book by Patrick Lencioni, and he has a, an incredible volume set on, and he writes like a, uh, uh, it's a fable. So he tells a story and he illustrates the principle. And then at the back of the, the book, he gives you the, the, uh, the nuts and bolts of what he was teaching. This is about motive. And this is where I learned everybody can lead, but not everybody should lead. And he says, this is his latest book, but he says he should have wrote this book first because he would go and work with CEOs of these massive, huge companies. And these leaders were leading for all the wrong reasons. And he said, now that I've figured that part out, I start with motive. Why do you want to lead? Because that will determine whether you take and do the hard work that you need to do to become the leader that you need to be to face the challenges that you've got today. Mm -hmm. So there's four or five books, four books yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. No, great. Uh, I'll just add it to the ever-growing list. <laughs> I get it. Totally. Yeah. Um, but no, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, and then I think lastly, you have a, a, web, a webinar coming up. Yes, I do. Um, so if people are interested, uh, do you mind sharing what, what it's about and how they can get involved? Sure. It, it's uh, it's a, a webinar on the unrealized pandemic of COVID-19, and it's nap, six steps to start navigating your loss. And it's on July the 17th. People can go to my website, robertjclaxton.com, and up in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little button that says the unrealized pandemic of COVID-19, and it will take them, they can register, it's for free. And we're going to do a webinar and I'm going to go over the six steps that you need to do and have and start to uh, start processing your grief. And uh, I'll go into great, greater detail during that one hour webinar about what they are. And I'm going to give them some, some tools to help them figure that out. So just go to my website awesome. and uh, love to have anyone. Great. I think that'll uh, 
given what we've talked about already today, I think uh, that'd be really helpful to a lot of listeners here. That's awesome. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. If people need to get in touch with you, uh, I well, you've already said your website, robertjclaxon.com. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, is there any preferred mode of contacting you? Well, they can email me at bob at robertjclaxton.com. And, uh, or they can text me at 780-264-4955. That's all on my website as well. Great. Uh, they can reach out to me. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and I'm on everything else. So LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much again. You're welcome. Uh, I, thank you. Like I said, you've been in the, in the leadership game for a long time and uh, it's exciting to kind of hear how your your own kind of philosophy has morphed over time as a result of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you.